Scott Olson, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. John, uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm super excited to meet with you. We've been preparing for this episode for a while now, and it's always fun to meet with different thought leaders and experts in different arenas of leadership. Today, we're, we're going to be focusing on finding fulfillment and leaving the frustrations behind in our organizations and in our leadership approach. Now, of course, there's no shortage of opportunities for us to feel deflated, frustrated, discouraged, um, and even overwhelmed at work. And I think the work of leadership is just really hard. And so leaders often feel those things. And while I'm, you know, as a leader, I'm trying to support my people, who's trying to support me. And I think particularly during the time of COVID, where leaders have been expected to show a lot more understanding and empathy, uh, they've had a heavy lift, a heavy load, both, you know, organizationally, uh, operationally, and, and emotionally, uh, to be able to deal with all of that. Uh, but we don't always have that same support coming to us as the leader within the organization. So I think as we talk today, we'll be able to dissect this a little bit and talk about those elements that are hard, um, but how we can learn from them, grow from them, set them aside, and then ultimately go into a positive space where we can find meaning, fulfillment, and purpose in what we do each and every day. As we get started, I wanted to share Scott's bio with everybody. Scott Olson is author of the first promotion transition certificate course. During more than 40 years of leading high-performance teams in consequential environments, Scott developed the concepts which lead to the core value of this innovative training program, find fulfillment and leave frustration behind. Scott is founder of Glenhaven International LLC, principal and co-founder of Can Trust Will LLC, and CEO of Olson Strategic Initiatives. Scott, again, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for joining me. Anything you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context before we launch on into the conversation? Um, yeah, I mean, my, my expertise uh, and my, my approach to this is, is very organic, and it, it really comes from um, where leadership started for me and where leadership begins, which uh, was when I, I was hired as a climbing guide on Mount Rainier when I was 15 years old. Um, and um, starting in a hugely consequential environment and really grappling with how do you get people to do what you need them to do and be happy about it is the root of a lot of what you're going to hear from me today. So that's the trajectory. And uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Perfect. Thank you so much for that additional background. And, you know, this really is important work. And so I, I commend you for the efforts you put in. Uh, I, I think we really do need to have this conversation more often. And ultimately, whether it's in our personal lives, whether it's in our organizational professional lives, whether we're in a formal leadership role, uh, or maybe perhaps more informally having an opportunity to influence those around us, I think we, we all need to be able to think about you know, a more growth mindset orientation, you know, uh, an abundance mindset orientation, all of which requires us to be able to, to acknowledge and recognize the difficulties, the challenges we face, but then kind of get to the next step, right? Where we're not ruminating on those things all of the time and, ju and just swimming in the negative, but ultimately we, we leverage those experiences into something more positive. Uh, and I'm all about finding meaning, purpose, fulfillment, in the work that I do, that's certainly something I want anyone on my team to be able to do. And ultimately, I think that's going to drive the best outcomes for organizations. So it's, it's in the best interest of everybody to try to figure this stuff out, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, it, it really begins with the mindset. And I think that the, the most damaging thing in the leadership world is kind of this presumption that we have that when you transition into that leadership role, whether you're doing it for the first time or you're doing it um, uh, for the, the third or fourth time, is this, this notion that you're, you're going into that leadership role because you have to. And being in that leadership role requires sacrifice. And it's really difficult and it's really hard and you don't get to do the fun things anymore. That attitude is so damaging. And the, the reason it's damaging is because it makes leadership a, a bad thing. It makes it a negative thing. It makes it a thing that you have to struggle with. And the reality of it is leading teams, leading things 
is great fun, particularly when you're doing it. And it's, it's really fulfilling, but you, you have to understand what leading actually is. And you have to transition your mindset from doing the work to making sure the work gets done. And so, you know, for me, a lot of it is making sure you ask the right questions. And when you're, when you're looking at leadership fundamentals, and that's really what we're talking about, right? Leadership fundamentals. And it, the interesting thing about the leadership development industry is everybody in the industry wants to coach the CEO. They, they want to do the high level, uh, you know, expert level coaching. And, and I think about athletics. There's, there is no world-class athlete pick your sport, pick your favorite athlete, you will see that that person, that woman, that man, always drilling the fundamentals, always doing the basics. And why is that? It's because the highest performance comes from doing the basics perfectly. So first promotion transition certificate course and the work we do at Glen Haven International is all about reviewing those fundamentals and making sure the fundamentals are done correctly. And it starts with the first question. Usually when you go to leadership training, the first question they ask is, what is leadership? What is leadership to you? And I really think that's the wrong question because you're going to get to that later. The question I like to ask is, where does leadership begin? Where does it start? And what you were talking about just now, this, this notion of lead from where you stand, and you don't necessarily have to have a title to lead, that, that's true. But what does it mean? What does lead from where you stand mean? You're, you're in a job somewhere. When do you know you should be leading today? And when do you know you should not? Some people really think leadership begins the first time you get promoted. And that, that, that's true. We think at Glen Haven International, leadership begins when you're responsible for more stuff than you can do, when you don't have bandwidth. And that's really where the struggle is, is as, as soon as you need to do more stuff than one person can possibly do, you need other people to help you. Uh, and it doesn't really matter if you are the CEO of JP Morgan, or if you're nine years old and you need your kid brother to help you clean your room. As soon as you need somebody else, you need the leadership skill. You need the ability to um, create an environment where they will choose to do what you need to do what you need them to do rather than what they want to do. He wants to go play. You need him to help you help, help him clean your room. That is a leadership behavior. So when that happens, I think two things happen. One is how do you convince him? And the other is you start thinking you're a failure, right? If you can't do everything and you need help, particularly in Western society, we start thinking, ugh wow, I suck because I, I can't do it all. There are, you know, people on my sales team who are better salespeople than me. Why am I the boss? You know, I need to do all the big accounts. And that's the frustration piece. And that's where new leaders really get derailed because yeah. they start struggling with, I can't do it all. I'm a failure. I need to be better than everybody. And down that frustration spiral, they go. And that's where we need to put our effort. And that's where we put our effort at Glen Haven International. Yeah. And part of what you're just describing with new leaders in formal leadership roles is this imposter syndrome that often takes hold. Yeah. Um, and, and it really is a shift in mentality, like you were saying, because I, I think traditionally, particularly in Western cultures, um, you, you go back in time a little bit. And I think of like my parents' generation and certainly their parent, you know, my grandparents' generation, that what they meant by leadership was perhaps a little bit different than what we mean by leadership. And exactly. they were, they were all about command and control and kind of yes. the authoritative style and the charismatic and, you know, those sorts of things. And, and there's a time and a place for all of that. Um, but in today's knowledge economy, we really need leaders um, who recognize that th they have expertise on their team that they need to tap into that they don't have. Um, and it's, it's not an admission of fault or, you know, not being capable. It's just, there's, there's no way uh, that that one person can stay on top of all of the different areas that they're managing. And so you recognize that you have the intellectual humility to acknowledge and accept that. Um, and then you, you have, you're, you're um, secure enough in yourself that you can actually rely on those around you to get stuff done uh, and to, and to provide, you know, value to the marketplace. 
Uh, and in today's world, if you if you are even remotely like a, a micromanaging style of a leader, trying to have everything funnel through you and trying to as, assert your expertise onto everyone on your team, you know, you're not going to be very successful. Uh, and innovation is going to take a nosedive. And ultimately, people aren't going to be happy. They're not going to be fulfilled. They're not going to be productive. And it's a it's a negative all the way around. So in today's world, in most circumstances, I think we need leaders uh, like you're describing who simply can acknowledge th that they're in a role. Um, there's operational components to being a leader with, you know, in a formal leadership role in an organization, but there's a, there's a lot more be beyond the operational elements and the kind of administrative tasks that have to be performed. It's much more about, you know, bringing together this team of people with diverse backgrounds, diverse skill sets, competencies, and capabilities and together, we're going to be creative and innovate and come up with solutions to problems, um, tapping into every single person's unique area of expertise, their unique worldview, background, et cetera. And that's, that's the leader that thrives. That's the leader that through their team, not in spite of their team or by overpowering and kind of controlling their team, they're able to ultimately find their career success. Because like you said, being a leader in an effective way is super fun. And ultimately, those people are going to get noticed and they're going to get promoted because they're able to leverage the capacities of their people. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And I think the, 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 the business world really struggles with um, what I call the player coach syndrome, um, particularly at the emerging level, at the, 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 the team leader level and the team leader manager level. You get promoted generally in in business and in the commercial world and, and even in government. And I, I come from government. I was FBI agent for 21 years and a prosecutor for six years before that. And the the best performers, the best investigators, the best trial attorneys become the, the team leaders. And that's that's where the struggle is because you're you're really good at playing the the sport, and all of a sudden they make you the coach, and you have your foot in these two worlds. And when you, it, the part of the frustration I think comes from not understanding what your job is. And in sports, the coach has no conflict. If you, you know, pick your favorite professional basketball team and look at the coach, the coach, even if the coach used to be a basketball player, cannot cannot go out on the court and play a position and help the team win. So what's the coach's job? And a lot of people think that you know the coach's job is to run drills and and select players and and to to do these specific things, and and yeah, those are the things the coach does. But what's the coach's? The coach's job is to win championships. The coach's job is to win games, and and people forget that because they think it's the team's job to win games. No. A player can play very well, and if the team loses, the coach gets fired. We're going to keep the good player. If the player performs poorly, then the, the player is going to get fired. But it's the coach's job to win games. What does the coach do to win games? Gets the best players, does drills, puts the right people in the right positions. Is the coach on the sideline you know, feeling bad that he or she is not playing the game? No, that coach is focused on winning the game and is thinking, I got to pull this player out. I got to move this player around. I got to do this. I got to do that so that we win this game so that we can win the championship. Now, take that mindset to your regional sales manager. What does that regional sales manager often do? That person is a top performer. And now, you know, hey, Julie, you made your numbers for four years. You're going to run the, the sales team. And now what does Julie think? Well, now I got two jobs. I got to run all my big accounts and I got to take care of all these people. She's thinking, well, I got to, I got to coach people and train people. She's thinking about the things that her tasks, but is she really thinking, what's my job? My job now is not to run accounts. My job now is to make sure this region makes its numbers. And I can't do that by myself. And that's the struggle. I have now for the first time in my life, thinks Julie, been given more than any person can possibly do. And what she needs to do is work through, I am not a failure because I have an assignment that is bigger than one person. What do I need? 
I need a team that I can put on the court that can accomplish this outcome for me. That will is the first step to restructuring her mindset into high performance. And then the next step is understanding since I have more to do than one person can possibly do, and I am not a failure because I can't do that, what do I need? I need help. And I get to choose. I get to choose the best salespeople. I get to train the worst salespeople. I get to move people around to do what? To accomplish my job, which is making this the best regional sales force in the company. Um, and the, the key thing for that for Julie to look for is the feeling of gratitude. Because if people are helping you and they're helping you do what you need to get done, if you're not feeling gratitude, that's the first big flag. If you're not feeling gratitude when people are helping you, you're probably not ready to be a leader. Um, and that, that sense of gratitude takes us really to the first thing that emerging leaders should do, which is when people are helping you do your job, you have a good sense of your job, people are helping you, express gratitude, tell them thank you. Great sales meeting, you, you pulled down that account. I'm feeling good because you nailed that account. You're feeling good because you nailed that account. Now, what are we doing? We're spiraling upwards. We're both feeling fulfilled. You nailed the account. I'm feeling good because I sent you on that account. And it's, it's not as sophisticated as it sounds. It's human nature, right? It's human behavior. But it's really important. And I think we're missing it at the emerging leader level. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And you just referred to, you know, hopefully we're creating this upward spiral of mm. positivity and motivation and performance, right? But just as easily, we can cause the downward negative spiral. <laughs> yes. And, yeah. and so, you know, we have to be able to show genuine, authentic gratitude towards our people. That starts with us realizing as a leader, it's not all about me, right? Yes. Um, and, and, and I, you, I'm sure you've experienced it. I've certainly experienced it. The leader who is very quick to throw anyone under the bus when something doesn't go well, instead of taking personal responsibility for, you know, their role as the leader on, you know, right. and the buck stops, stops with them. But then they're also the very first one to accept the praise and and take credit for anything that does go well. And again, kind of throws their people on, under the bus because they're not acknowledging all the contributions of the individual players on their team. Right. And so that, in my mind, that's a really insecure leader. And to your point, that person probably has no business being a leader. They're not ready mentally, emotionally. They're not mature enough to be a leader. Uh, they make it all about them. And so, and I think Unfortunately, again, this comes back to kind of the old paradigm that was kind of the model in previous generations of, of how a leader kind of positioned themselves and asserted themselves. Uh, that doesn't work um, today. And, and people on your team with their diverse backgrounds, with their unique skill sets and areas of expertise, you know, they, they can see through that a mile away. They can see, you know, that someone's taking credit for their work. They can see that they're not being appreciated. And, you know, in a labor market like we're in right now, it's really hard to attract and retain really good people. And you know what, if you're a leader and you're treating your people that way, and kind of into that negative downward spiral, guess what, all your best people are going to leave. And then you have zero chance of being successful as a leader, because you're not going to have good people on your team. And so, to your point, we absolutely need to, uh, to counteract, you know, some of those perhaps old fashioned tendencies. Um, towards kind of this old model of leadership. And instead, you know, lean into the gratitude, have the intellectual humility to recognize that, yes, I play a role. I'm the leader. The buck stops with me. I play a role in the, su the success and the failures of my team. But then I also need to, you know, hold everyone mutually accountable. And that means not only when things don't go great, we have a, a performance conversation, but when things go well, man, I got to show gratitude. I, sh I have to um, let them know that they are the reason for our success and help everyone recognize and understand that how their contributions are contributing, you know, over to the overall success of the team and to the organization. That is the secure leader. Um, that's the one uh, who, who, who sees their people first. It's not about them. It's about their people. It's about developing their people, helping their be people, um, you know, achieve their maximum potential and this, the, the nice side effect of that is, of course, I'm going to be more successful when my 
people are are achieving their full potential. Yeah, that, absolutely. And it it really starts with the the mindset of what's my job, and your your job is the result that you're required to produce. It's not the things that you do when you're sitting at your desk or traveling around a sales area or you know giving out assignments or whatever it is you do. You it starts with a fundamental understanding of what number does my team need to produce? What game are we playing? And what do we need to do to win? And I think that the hard part, what maybe a lot of people listening are thinking right now is that all this is great, but what, what do I do? You know, what do I do when this podcast episode ends and I go back to work? What do I do? Well, Here's my advice for what to do. You take two days, if you're a leader, and look at your people and express gratitude and acknowledge skill. Do those two things. Start with your mindset of what outcome am I responsible for? What's my game? What do I do to win? And then every time you see somebody who is not doing what they want to do and is doing what you need them to do to produce your number or your outcome, feel that gratitude and say thank you. And you don't have to do a big public meeting where you're, you know, criticizing private, praising. But people want to hear thank you when they do well. I, I'm almost 60 years old. I, I want to hear a thank you when I do well. I want that. And so, so give that. And then the other thing is, when you see somebody do something that is really difficult and they do it well, when they're showing skill, this is different than gratitude. This is, wow, I saw that you did that. You're really good at that. That's not a thank you. That is your, wow, that's really, really great. And it doesn't matter if it's, it's filling out a, com a complicated voucher or you know pulling a client back in or whatever it is. If you do those two things for two days, express gratitude and acknowledge skill, watch, watch what happens around you. Watch what unfolds. You will see a change if you do that. You'll see a change in your team. You may even see a change in yourself. And everybody who's listening to this can do that now. Yeah. They can do that today, right now. Watch what happens. It, it's really impressive if you do it. Yeah, and I really like the focus on you know, getting outside of just what's going on in our head. I can, I can have that intellectual humility. I can feel that genuine gratitude, but if I'm not taking the chance to act on it and, and actually express it to, to acknowledge the great work that someone's doing, to say, thank you, to express that gratitude. If I'm not actually doing that, um, then people don't know that you feel that way. I think a lot of times leaders do feel that way, but they don't, they haven't found the way to, to, effectively communicate it back to their team, to their people. And the reality is everyone off, you know, people like to hear it in different ways. Some people you send them a quick text message or an email. Yeah, that's good. Other people want the public praise. Other people are, hor are mortified by the public praise and they just would love for you to just stop by their office and just say, Hey, good job. Um, and so know your people know how they would like to receive that gratitude, the, the expression of gratitude in those attaboys. And, and then do it. Uh, and, don't, uh, you know, I, I definitely uh, uh, believe in the notion of never suppress a kind thought. So if I notice something, just say it, you're, you know, may, maybe that you might feel like, oh, that's too mushy. That's too touchy feely. No, it's not like, just say it, just share it. People want to feel validated. They want to feel appreciated. They want to be seen and heard and they want to be acknowledged for the good work that they do. And when we can do that consistently, then it's a game changer. It's a game changer for them because we know there's so many studies that show why people leave organizations. And it's very rarely for those extrinsic types of things like pay, benefits, whatever. Like those are important. People want to be paid fairly. They want to feel valued. But the, like the number one thing that ultimately will drive someone to either decide to stay or leave is their relationship with their coworkers and their relationship with their boss. So if you want to have a, if, if you can establish a meaningful relationship of mutual accountability and trust with your people, help them to feel genuinely cared about and valued, and that you express that to them on a regular basis, guess what? most of your people are going to stay. They're going to be loyal. They're going to be committed. They're going to help you 
drive success for your team and for the organization. And that's what everyone wants. That will lead to success in their careers. Uh, and so ultimately, that's it's going to be a win-win-win all the way around. And, and But when that doesn't happen, you're going to lose your good people. Uh, it doesn't matter if you pay like top in the industry. If, if you're a jerk and or even if you're not a jerk, like you actually are a very nice, kind person, but you don't like find a way to show it, people are going to think you're a jerk and then they're going to leave. <laughs> yeah. I, what, what I've found over, over the decades is people don't follow you because they like you. They, they don't. Um, they follow you because they know you like them. And I've seen this over and over that the, the grumpy senior guy on the, on the squad and the, you know, the, the mid-level sort of journeyman person would come in to start running the squad and the, the old guys, yeah, another, you know, another young person coming in to run this thing. If that squad supervisor made sure that the old agent knows the supervisor is really impressed with his background, with his work, and really likes him, that old guy will complain and be grumpy and will do everything he's asked to do. Why? Because he knows he's appreciated. He knows he's liked. And that just underscores that leadership is not inward facing. Self-development and reflection is inward facing, and that's really important. But leadership is outward facing. People don't follow you because you're an influence leader or a servant leader or an inspirational leader. They don't care what type of leader you are. They care about how you feel about them. And so I think when you, when you look at a truly great leader, what you will see is fascination. Fascination is outward facing. And they're fascinated by two things. They're fascinated by the people that they're surrounded by and by the work that's being done. And when you were talking about how people like taking praise and some people like a text message and some people like the public acknowledgement and some people are horrified at the public acknowledgement and just want you to drop by the office. How do you get there as a leader? How do you understand that? Well, your job isn't to go on sales calls. Your job is to understand your people so the right person goes on the right sales call so that they can succeed. And how do you know that? You said, by understanding your people. My language for that is be fascinated by the people. When's the last time you were fascinated by something, whether it was a Rubik's Cube or a little puzzle or, you know, the, 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 the person you dated in high school, whatever really fascinated you. When you're fascinated by something, you pick at it and you pick at it and you pick at it and you don't sleep until you understand it. Great leaders are fascinated with people. They pick at people and pick at people and pick at people until they know, yeah, I got to send this person over here to do that sales call. This um, young lady needs to be here to learn a little more. Uh, this guy needs to be back a house boy, this one is charismatic and she needs to do our, our sales pitches and all of our public speaking. And how do you know that if you're fascinated by people? And that's, that's a flag, but it's also something to develop. You're going to perform as a great leader if you're fascinated by people and you're fascinated by the work being done because all of the, here are the top 10 behaviors that great leaders do. Here are the five things that great leaders never do. All of those lists will fall into place for you if you cultivate fascination with people and with the work being done, it really will. Yeah. Amen. Well, Scott, it has been a real pleasure talking with you today. The time has flown by. Uh, I want to be mindful of your schedule and your time and appreciate your generosity in, in chatting with me today. Before we close, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the two best ways to get in touch are firstpromotiontransition.com. That's the certificate course. And then glenhaveninternational.com. Uh, and of course, uh, Scott Olson exec on LinkedIn. Those are the, the three best ways um, to get a hold of me. Uh, and then, you know, for me, the, the, the final word is if, if you truly want to be a high performance leader, um, do these four things starting today. Express gratitude, acknowledge skill, put your people where they're strong, set them up to succeed, and take responsibility for the outcome. 
you're responsible for winning the game. They're responsible for playing the game. If you do those four things, watch what unfolds around you. Your world will change. It really will. Excellent. Thank you, Scott. It has been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Scott and his team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.